Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. I'm joined today by art prof teaching artist, Alex Rowe. And we have a special guest artist today, Jonathan McGregor, who is currently a senior at Columbus State University as a painting major in Georgia. And what we're gonna be doing during the stream is reviewing Jonathan's portfolio because Jonathan is considering probably very likely going to be going on to an MFA degree at some point. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. We have on this slide a overview of all the pieces that we're gonna be reviewing today by Jonathan. And Jonathan, can you just tell us in a nutshell, what are some of the themes that you're working with in your paintings and photography right now? Yeah, so I am a figurative representational oil painter and um, I like to deal with religious symbolism of the Western society and how um, it kind of fuses together with modern concepts and philosophies. So, yeah. So Alex, what is your first take on all these pieces together as a group? Together as a group, I love them. And the biggest thing is that all of them appear very clearly yours. They all have that same sense of style and form regardless of the differing media. And what I really love is the actual, and we could talk about it more throughout the portfolio, but the similar color palette through all of them. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting how it's similar, but not identical in all of them. And you're making different colors pop in each one. And I know, Jonathan, you were wondering about color, about mm -hmm. how to go about it. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of color? Yeah, so recently I've been um, experimenting more with the underpainting as kind of a pronounced um, like aspect to the work. So I would start with like a light underpainting of like pink or gold and then just um, kind of create the grisaille and then kind of work around um, the underpainting as kind of like the anchor to the whole painting. And so just trying to explore that a bit more. So are you wondering if you should depart from that and try something different or is that pretty comfortable where you are right now? Yeah, I think mainly I kind of just want to experiment more with complementary colors and kind of see if it's a wise um, decision to go that way or if I should just maintain more traditional aspects to it. What do you think, Alex? You're the king of complementary <laughs> color underpaintings. I'm sure you can speak about this. Yeah, so in our uh, um, acrylic video, I talk about using complementary colors as the other painting unique to what will eventually be on top of them. But as far as exciting or non-traditional colors is the underpainting, some of my favorite underpaintings are using like bright, vibrant pink. And it's really cool seeing the effects that can go through. And as we look at your pieces, there are some where that is coming through really well. And it's, yeah, definitely something like you're asking the right questions about whether or not it works well for you and how far you should take it. But I think right now it's working really well. And I'm excited to see it kind of be explored more in your work. I think it would be worth shaking it up. Because here's the thing, if you try, it looks terrible, don't do it again, right? <laughs> because my feeling right now is that the color varies. You have some pieces where it's a very limited palette, like the Mary Magdalene image on the far left, the long hair with the red and the yellow highlights. That's a very limited color scheme. It doesn't have any cool colors, at least that I can see. And then the image of the female figure that's sitting on the couch, that's also largely warm colors. But then when I look at the image that's in the center bottom, the way that the greens, the cool colors interact with the warm colors, you're getting some beautiful contrast in there. So my feeling is that you've got a lot of great stuff going on, but I would push it more because my whole issue with color is that I was so conservative about color and I wish when I was an undergrad that I had been a little bit more crazy with it for lack of a better word. So give it a shot. 
Okay, for sure. All right, let's dig into some of the individual pieces. So how about we start with this one, which is titled Magdalene. And for those of you guys who don't know who Mary Magdalene is, actually, I'm gonna have you explain this. You're gonna explain it much better than me, Jonathan. <laughs> okay, so she was um, a follower of Jesus back in the um, biblical times. And she is widely like misunderstood in some areas and then, um, understood in other areas, but she was just a faithful follower. And um, she is known to have been possessed with seven demons when Jesus had died and kind of gone off the rails and like went a little crazy. Um, but I just loved the imagery of her. And some say she was a mystic. Some say that she was a widow, um, I think to a judge, I believe. Um, so she's just this widely um, kind of talked about the Renaissance, like every tradition loves her. So I just thought I would paint um, my- We've got here Donatello's sculpture of the penitent Magdalene. And if you guys haven't seen this, it's a striking piece, it's in Florence. And I was so happy, Jonathan, that I found the photo on the right because that's so similar in terms of mm. showing the length of the hair, which is characteristic of Mary Magdalene. So from a history point of view, she's all over our history. So mm -hmm. Alex, what's your take? My first take is that I love how it's both recognizable as a Mary Magdalene piece, but also very unique. It's playing into very few of the traditional tropes. And me, even then merely only hearkening to like the color red, for instance, which is so commonly used as like her veil color in art history. Um, I think that Really, my biggest issues with this one are more on the technical side, where the palette is so limited that I think that using some greens in the shadows could really like enliven this one a bit. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at the very base there, with the legs starting to show, like it's such a dramatic cut with the shadow that there was a split second of wondering what those were. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of my favorite pieces in the portfolio, Jonathan, because it's so stark and powerful. There's very little involved. A lot of the times I'm always pushing people to add stuff into the background because oftentimes it just feels empty. But there's a drama to this image that I love and it's really mysterious. It, it's so much a piece that I just want to know more about it. And you have this craving as a viewer to know who she is. I love the fact that you have so little of the legs, just this little tiny bit, everything else is the hair. So I think it's a great piece. I do think though you could work on your articulation of the hair a little bit more because I really like the sections on the left and the right where it gets very, very blurry. That's mm -hmm. beautifully done. Like Charisma here is saying it looks so soft and fluffy. So keep that going. But there are areas in the middle where it starts to get a little bit monotonous and I want things to be a little bit more crisp or concrete just as a contrast against what's going on in the other areas. But I think this is really outstanding. Now, before we get into some of the other images, because I know that looking at these, a lot of the titles do have religious connotations. Like this one's called Sunday's Best. The other one was... Magdalene, we have others coming up. Is religion part of this on purpose or what's going on there with that theme? Yeah, so for um, my senior year, my kind of senior thesis, which is like my final art show, is taking um, religious iconography and making it and reinterpreting it into the modern world. So I do want to hark on um, like the classical traditions of um, religious artwork and kind of the heights of Florentine art and how does it interact with today's society and kind of um, growing up Christian and that kind of ideology behind that. So Alex, what's your take on this? Uh, this one is my favorite in your portfolio. I love this image, just everything about it. The colors are working so well. And this one, you're using that vibrant pink underpainting, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, like you can see how well that's showing through in the skirt and against the back of that green wall. 
I love not only the religious references in this painting, but also the art history references of the Ophelia painting behind her. Like it's just, yeah, the more I look at this painting, the more it becomes my absolute favorite. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, like Darwin has spotted, obviously, the Ophelia painting by Millet. Neil is saying the same thing. I love the painting on the background. There's a painting on a painting. I like mm -hmm. that painting in the background, Jonathan, because I didn't notice it right away. I mm. found it eventually, but oftentimes yeah. stuff in the background, the flip side is that it can get distracting. But I think mm. you did a nice job of pushing it back because it doesn't have a lot of detail. So I think that's really good. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm wondering, is that a phone in her hand on the left? Mm -hmm. Yep. Because it could just be the photo. Maybe mm -hmm. if I saw this in real life, I'd be able to see that a little bit better. But I feel like if it weren't for the phone, this could easily been an Ander Zorn painting. Mm. There's not a lot here in terms of contemporary life. I mean, sure, mm -hmm. this could exist. I mean, people I'm sure have houses like this, but I guess I'm curious about how you want to bring the modern world in because that is, I think a bit of a cliche. People say, well, I want to make it modern. Boom, there's a phone. Now it's mm -hmm. modern. And I mm -hmm. think that you got to get more specific. What are you really trying to say? You're trying to say that religion has changed or, oh, it's always the same or like, what, what is the thesis to what you want to say about religion? You don't have to answer right now. I'm just saying that for me, it's a little bit too vague. And I'm also wondering, do you want this to be personal or is this a commentary about religion in general? That is an important distinction to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one that I've been trying to grapple with if I want it to be more, um, world view like kind of more not personal or personal and so yeah some of the pieces go in between and that last one was pretty more on the personal side but yeah well alex what's your take i mean are you feeling like the pieces feel more personal or do they seem more like a world take based on what we've seen so far on what we've seen so far i feel like so the Magdalene one I felt like was an examination of the figure of Magdalene. Whereas in the Sunday's Best, I feel like that was a very unique portrait of either a unique person or a private image of someone's religious um, lifestyle or mindset. Um, I think that there's, there's just enough small details in this that make it seem to me very more personal like the three candles, like with only the center one lit uh, or the Ophelia painting, there's enough here where it's, I don't know the meaning. I don't know the message of what makes it personal, but I see that there is intent behind it. Mm. And I think that that's so an element that can be brought further into these. Let's look at this piece. It's called Stigmata and it's gouache on paper. It's much smaller so is it cut out paper that's on top of a white sheet, Jonathan? Yeah, so this was back, I did a study abroad in Italy. And so this is kind of the birth of my modern religion, like the fusion kind of. Um, so this is a collage piece and I think it's three different watercolor sheets that I cut the flowers out and then I cut the hand out and then I put it on, um, yeah, a piece of paper. So I'm curious to hear from people in the chat, how many of you guys in the chat have ever made artwork that had a religious theme, any type of religion? Because I do think religious art is very challenging because obviously people have very strong feelings about religion, people interpret it in different ways. And so it, it's a risk. And my feeling right now looking at your pieces is you have these little moments where it does pop out like this one. It, it's, most people will look at this and understand it's a stigmata. It's a very common image that a lot of people have seen before in the past. I mean, I feel like this one, it's not as blatant because you can get some of it, but it's not super obvious the way it is in the stigmata. And mm -hmm. so I guess my impression right now is that you're hesitant about making this religious work because part of you lets it out once in a while. And then other times you seem to really hide it. And so I'm wondering if maybe in the next time that you're working that you should start thinking about like, do I really want this to be religious work or do I want it to be 
more just a suggestion, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Alex, what do you think? I think that in an interesting way, I think that your more subtle take on religions in the first two pieces were so much more effective and powerful in their being small and personal in that way. Like the the growing denomination is like religious, but not belonging to any denomination, at least in America. And for this one being so like obviously like the stigmata image, it just doesn't have any of that subtlety or wonder in it. It just seems very like right off the bat, you see the image and you you get the whole presence where there's no like secret surprises or wonder within them or within this one. Tom G is saying, I love the stigmata image, but maybe the colors could be more vibrant, either the blood or the flowers. And it looks like a lot of people here have done religious work. Like Albert is saying, I make religious art as a Muslim artist. Maya says, I haven't, I don't think I have. And Victor says, I like to borrow from its iconic poses, but make the setting different. And Satnir says, I don't remember if I ever did, probably not. Shaim says, I tend to stay away from making the religious type of art. So yeah, it, it's sort of playing with fire a little bit. I mm-hmm. agree with Alex. I think this piece feels less personal. I feel that I don't know as much about you when I look at this piece. It feels like an image I've seen in other places. And the painting's just not as strong technique wise. Mm-hmm. I think it's a flatter image. I think the hand is not very well defined in terms of the anatomy. I feel like I want a little bit more tension in that hand. So maybe that's a technical thing to be working on. So Alex, how about this one? Not my brother's keeper. This is like, again, I love this one. And Clara, you already mentioned how wonderful the red and the green is playing together with this one. But this is such a good example of that incorporating subtlety where in this case, it took the title to be like, oh, this is uh, the religious concept of like the murder of Cain with Cain and Abel and that response of I am not my brother's keeper. But this does not instantly strike you as a religious image. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another huge success that you're doing where this is an image conveying that spirituality, but not in an overt way. Um, I think that for this one, uh, my biggest question about it is like with the figures, did you use models for these or self-portrait or were they kind of um, combined from like photo references and things like that? Yeah, so this one is um, a combination. I dressed up as both of them and then I went to go and take photos and then I just combined them and then painted Okay, them. I was so yeah. curious because they both kind of look like you and that's why I was wondering if that was an intentional like self-portraiture thing. Mm -hmm. which in that case, it's very powerful of that two different dualities of the self. But I think Mm -hmm. if if that's the case and that's the intent, then they only look slightly like you, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's, oh, I can't tell if these are different people that accidentally look like you, which I did Mm -hmm. for the first five years of art school, (laughs) or (laughs) if it's like you, but it looks almost like other people. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, it's both a self-portrait. I did want the one on the um, ground. I wanted Abel, yeah, to be more of a feminine, so the duality of both the masculine and feminine presence, and then the yin and yang. And actually, Jonathan, for people who don't know Cain and Abel, can you just give us a quick summary? Yeah, so they're the sons of Adam and Eve in the Bible, and... um, they, Cain and Abel had to give their blessing to God and Cain's blessing was denied. And so, and Abel's was accepted. So they went out to the field and then Cain um, struck Abel and killed him. And then he said, what am I, my bro- not my brother's keeper or something. Yeah, something like that. Landon is saying, yes, the fact that they look like the same person adds to the meaning of the picture. And Cerulean is saying, I like that duality in one person idea. I'll tell you, Jonathan, this is my absolute favorite piece in your portfolio. It is so striking. And the reason I like it is because first of all, the painting technique is wonderful. I love this background, that texture, 
the brushwork is so lively and it has a really good feeling of movement, but it doesn't get mushy ever. It has mm -hmm. a nice crispness and the structure to it while also having that fluidity. And it's funny, I feel like this image is quote, more religious than mm -hmm. the stigmata image, which I know sounds really weird because the stigmata image is more visibly a religious image that people associate immediately. But to me, this one feels more religious. And I wonder mm -hmm. if it's because of the drama of the positioning, mm -hmm. because that is something we associate with religious imagery of the past. People are always like, Bleh! you know, they've got like <laughs> their arms twisted behind their neck and stuff like that. But it could also be that the landscape almost feels like this storm. And that makes me think about plagues and, I don't know. Am I nuts, Alex? <laughs> I mean, I think you're, when you said that, it made me realize that we might be having an interesting semantical difference in like ha describing religious imagery, where it's like this one feels more personally religious for you. And I think, therefore, we as viewers respond to it better. Whereas for the stigmata, it felt more like textbook religious. It felt more like this is a religious image, period. Um, and so it came off as more <laughs> lowercase r religious, you know, like, <laughs> whereas this comes off as capital R religious, you know, and very powerful mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have another oil painting. It's called Your Pills Don't Look the Same Anymore. And this is oil on cotton. So is the painting painted on a crocheted piece, Jonathan? Yeah. So that was an old, um, like, placemat that my grandma made. Oh, you're not, did you gesso it first? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I gessoed it like three times. I think. <laughs> so Alex, this is a real change of pace. It's not figurative. It's on mm -hmm. the cotton now. What do we think about this? First off, I love that painting on the cotton in the embroidery image. It's comes. It's so unique, but it doesn't come off as, oh, why am I struggling for words now? It doesn't come off as gimmicky. It feels very wonderful. And I think that's because you're so um, intelligently using the colors within it. And it, uh, to borrow your phrase from last one, Clara, this one feels the most religious of all of them to me because it has that setup of that kind of like, I mean, my mom must have half a dozen Mary Magdalene images around her house, like in the kind of frame similar to this. So it strikes me as having that connotation to it. I think this is one of your most successful treatments of complementary colors. I love the orange highlights that are in there and that luminous Naples, yellowy, lavender highlight mm. area, gorgeous. And then of course the cotton pattern around it, I think it's it feels so intimate. Like I didn't know that this was, you said it was your grandmother's? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's from your grandmother, but it feels like something that was passed down through a family mm -hmm. relation. So I guess maybe what we're saying, Jonathan, is that the pieces that feel personally religious are resonating with us more. Mm -hmm. Now, my only thing about this one that I just would be really careful about is this image of prescription pills. It's pretty cliche. I tend to see it a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna pry into exactly what the pills are necessarily for you, but I just would be conscious of that because sometimes that can be misinterpreted in a different way. People might think it's about drug addiction. They might think, I'm gonna guess it's not about drug addiction. Is it or not? I don't know. No, no. Just I had a friend that overdosed. So, but it was for her anxiety or like it was for, well, it was for a deeper, like a harder medicine, but yeah. Yeah. So you just have to make sure you're not pulling in other subjects that might distract from mm -hmm. what you're really after. But I, I think this one's working really well. Okay, now we have American Communion. This is oil on canvas and this is a smaller piece. So Alex, how about this one? This one is funny where technically I really enjoy it. I really like what's going on, especially with the shadows and the incorporation of the patterning on the Wonder Bread wrapper within the painting. But it's funny because it, similar to the Stigmata one, it it comes out, it, the funny, um, I almost find it humorous in a way. Like, I, I, I hope it's intentionally like a little funny in there 
with the uh, the bread and the wine, but yeah, it just kind of doesn't go much further than that, the way that some of your other pieces have. I guess for me, it's hard to look at Wonder Bread and not laugh a little. Maybe it's the packaging. <laughs> I don't know, or the fact that it tastes like a pillow, but <laughs> I suspect that this was maybe trying to be funny, but it isn't really that funny. I feel like it's hard for me to look at and not just think, oh, pop art, Wayne Tebow, Andy Warhol. And yes, I do make the connection with the American communion. Actually, can you explain that to people, what it represents, just so people who don't know are informed? Yeah, so um, modern communion is like a wafer and then um, like grape juice. Um, but back then, obviously, it was wine and unleavened bread. But I wanted to create kind of a modern take on communion, like a very, like, I don't know, um, so I did Wonder Bread and Kool-Aid, kind of to represent the 1960s Jim Jones. I believe it was Jim Jones, like the cult. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, okay, it's, it's funny, like, the second you said the Kool-Aid thing, I was like, oh, is that, because, yeah, like, that's a really powerful concept that is not quite got in this image yet because mm -hmm. that was one where it was like the tragedy of that is for so long they were doing such good work and then just became a tragedy seemingly overnight historically but yeah and that's such a heavy concept that is it's not really portrayed as much in this painting mm -hmm. I guess I would just ask yourself, do I want this image to be funny? Because the thing is, I don't find it like, ha ha ha, I'm laughing so hard, but it does have a brightness to it. The bright yellow background, it's well illuminated. Obviously the polka dots are really saturated because the rest of your work has a fairly somber, serious tone to it. So when you bring in a piece like this, which is along the same modernity coming in contact with religion, it feels a little off base for me because it doesn't fit the sensibility that I see in your other pieces. And we also have some other people like Sapnir is saying, I like most of the artworks, but I crave a bit more pushing the composition so they are not so centralized. And Victor is saying, I like it because it's painted kind of romantically. So it's clashing in a sense. And Neil is saying, I'm kind of missing the vibrant colors of the previous ones. So lots of different things for you to consider. I think the idea is there, but we have to get more focused about what are you really after? Like, what is the atmosphere of this image? Okay, how about this one, Alex? Capability to feel. This one is really cool where the first big thing about this that's working really well with it is that even on the thumbnail, or for people watching it on the screen, like lean back, it works really successfully from far away as well as close up. And you get more surprises in the colors and the textile of the fabric as you get closer. But then the downside is there's some struggles going on with the hands in this one that are kind of making it, uh, they're not working too well in that area, which is frustrating because it's such a good piece otherwise. So I think a little bit more work in the hands could really go a long way with this one. I mean, I think the shirt is outstanding. It's some of the best color mixing that I've seen in a lot of your paintings, especially where you guys see that like Naples yellow in the upper right hand corner, and then you cascade downwards and it gets ochre but then the upper left hand corner is very cool. And at the same time, you retain the pattern that's in the stripes throughout the whole thing. So I think the shirt is absolutely phenomenal. Now, the problem is that because the shirt is so good, the hands for me, they just don't, they don't compare to what's going on with the shirt. And so I don't think that things necessarily have to be anatomically correct. But for me right now, the hands look very rubbery. And I feel like this is a very specific pose. And I want to understand a little bit more about okay, are these hands very flimsy? Are they more structured? Do they feel tense in some areas? So it might be worth actually taking a look at our video on the anatomy of the hand, because even if you're not going after something super realistic, it is good to be able to identify, okay, that is a bone, that is a tendon. So you get a little bit more structure in there because 
it, it's a little thing. Like it's it's not that big of a change that I'm wanting, but I think it would make a big difference in terms of the piece having just that extra punch to it in the end. Yeah, people are wondering what's in the middle and other people are pointing out AJ said it's a B and Trent is saying, I think it's a B. It took me a second to notice. And John Murph is asking, how about the posture of the hands? What would you say about them? Well, I'm wondering, Jonathan, what are you trying to say with the hands? Because I don't know a lot about religion and there's a B, there's the hands capability to feel. Is this a religious piece or is this a totally different subject? Um, so this one's kind of like a hybrid. It's not as religious. It's more like a personal experience. Um, when I was young, we just used to have like a garden in front of my house and um, I would go and take, like catch the bees in my hands when I was like probably like six. And then I would just like wait for them to sting me and then I'd like let them go. Like it was like, <laughs> it was like typical children stuff. Um, so I just um, kind of like did more. Like I went back through my memories and I just um, wanted to incorporate the bee because the bee has a um, kind of a religious symbol um, a little bit. And so I wanted to incorporate that back and then just kind of encapsulate it in a kind of, it's kind of pseudo iconography. I mean, it's very like placed and very structured and I associate that with religious imagery. You know, it would be cool to explore with this, like, what if so in, i know in like caravaggio's work sometimes he'll like have figures be almost like the source of light within the painting mm. and looking at the bee there was something somebody made a comment where the bee seems a little too close in space and that area seems a little hazy mm. but it would be fun to explore if the bee was not luminous not creating like light in a tacky sort of way but just mm -hmm. a little bit of reflective light within the palms of the hand around mm. the bee could be a really satisfying little cave created in there of light. Yeah, I might try that. I guess I'm trying to figure out, Jonathan, is the bee in front of the hand or is it under the hand? Because I'm getting a little confused about this edge. Yeah, it's supposed to be like in the middle kind of, um, but I don't think I did a well enough job like establishing that um, muscle right there, so. Yeah, it's supposed to be in the middle, but yeah. I was gonna tell you it would be better if it was in the middle because yeah. then it really seems to speak to something very specific. So I would fix that, but I love this idea of, be well, so here's the thing. I looked at this piece and I said to myself, maybe it's about some religious story I don't know about because it feels mm -hmm. religious to me. There's something about the positioning in the hands, the lack of the face, symbols for example albert is saying in utah bees are tied to mormonism this painting could be interpreted as being part of lds mythology and other people are also saying for example a bee dies after it stings so there's a lot i mean i feel like you do a whole series on this childhood story it's just very compelling i think Okay, how about this? We have a photo here out of many, many paintings that we've seen so far. So where does this fit in all your other work, Jonathan? Um, I think this fits, um, I try to do in every medium, I try to see how much I can put my voice into it and kind of continue um, what I'm trying to say with all my other work. So recently I took a photography, digital photography, and we had to, we had an assignment to create a tableau, which is like a set up interior space kind of um so i chose a dollhouse too and that kind of just like arranged the lighting and put an art history book in the window to make it look like landscape and everything okay <laughs> i was wondering how you did that that's cool <laughs> uh, yeah i like i think this one's really impressive as a photograph and i think that sometimes when there's a work that's not like the others like this one being the only photograph in the piece sometimes i'm more inclined to say like eh, just kind of shove this one aside like just do the other stuff but there's enough really good things going on in this one that i'd be really curious to see 
more photos included in your portfolio, just so that it isn't the odd man out. The only thing with this one is that, oh, excuse me, it kind of, there's a little bit of the imagery that's very blunt, which is not to say that it, you should shy away from it, but I think handling it in a more subtle way, like it's handled in some of your other pieces, could go really well. Like the, the noose imagery is used so often, and an example of it used very well and subtly is, if you've ever seen the movie No Country for Old Men, Mm -hmm. um, there's a scene where when Javier Bander is talking to a gas station attendant, oh, spoiler alert, he kills, but behind him there are bits of um, extension cord and they're hung mm -hmm. behind him like nooses. And it's so, so subtle. And you notice it that third time you watch it, you're like, oh, that's so like slightly unsettling. And I think this needs a little bit more of that, where I think it's such a powerful image conveyed in it with the dollhouse, with the noose, and the beautiful scene outside. But having a little bit more of that delicacy in it could be much more powerful. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan, Chloe is asking, is this a dollhouse? Like, did you actually get a dollhouse or did you visit someplace with a dollhouse? Yeah, so this was my mom's dollhouse growing up. So it's a metal 1960s dollhouse and I just asked her I was like <laughs> can I set it up in the living room and take a photo and she's like sure so yeah. Mike Davis is asking is the dark band slash shadow meant to represent something that's a question for you Jonathan um so I'm guessing to the left no that was um the from the two from the rope it's just the two um bands so I kind of liked how dramatic it swooped in and out but yeah doesn't mean too much. Emmy is saying, at first, I thought it was a painting. And actually, you know who you should look at, Jonathan? Have you ever seen Gregory Crudson's photographs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I so I don't have a slide, you guys, because I just thought of it. But look up Gregory Crudson. I'll put the name in the chat so you guys can get the right spelling. But he does photos that really look like paintings. They have a very theatrical quality to them. So that's a really great reference. I mean, I'm with Alex that the noose almost ruins the image for me. I find the lighting and the little pieces of light in the corner much more engaging than the noose. Because the noose, it's like, it's like you're trying so hard to make sure we see it. And I don't know that it has to be that blatant. So it's not to say again that you can't work with these themes. It's just that, again, it's, it's a very common image that you see a lot. And so you really have to figure out like, okay, how am I going to make this feel like mine? How is it going to feel like my image, not a generic one that I've seen all over the place? I mean, my feeling about the photography is go for it because I haven't seen all the other stuff. I know you've done other photographs is just one that we're looking at right now. But the way you talk about it, it doesn't sound like you're going to be happy if you cut this short. It sounds to me like you've got plenty to explore. And then another thing I would think about, maybe the photography is a, quote, sketch for your paintings. Or maybe you use the photos as a reference. I mean, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be totally separate. But there's enough of a connection between your photographs, I think, and your paintings that I think it would be worth pursuing. All right, this is the only drawing we have in the portfolio. So Alex, what do you think? This is really, I. it's such a beautiful and soft image. And I think that, yeah, it's this one in contrast to the photograph, it feels very much like a sketch of a painting you will do. Um, mm -hmm. So as much as I love the image and I love the delicacy in the drawing, it doesn't feel like it belongs with the rest of the images. I think it's just because it is the only drawing. Um, but I love the look and the feel and your handling of the graphite in this one. Yeah, I think I just would love to see either more like this, more flushed out to be finished final pieces. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, otherwise I feel like this one just seems too sketch-like for the portfolio. I mean, do you see it as a sketch, Jonathan? Or is it a full-out fledged artwork for you? Yeah, I... I kind of go back and forth about pencil, like graphite work. And that's um, kind of, that was going to be one of my questions is if I should put more uh, like preliminary or a more 
graphite work into my portfolio or if it should be mainly just paintings. Um, but I do see this kind of as a completion, um, but it is more of like a smaller completed work instead of like a- I would say for an MFA portfolio, you don't need to put in sketches. For a BFA portfolio, oftentimes they do like to see thumbnails, they like to see brainstorming, a sketchbook page, but MFA, I think they really want like a body of work that's uh -huh. finished. I mean, it's a nicely drawn piece. You obviously understand shadows and lighting very well, but it's a pretty generic image for me. I don't feel that there's a lot here that I haven't seen before. I mean, once you put Daphne there, Apollo and Daphne, she's the one that turned into a tree, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So basically Apollo was like chasing her. And so I think her father like turned her into a tree to make sure that he didn't get his hands on her basically. So we know that story, but I don't see a new take on it. In fact, what I found a little bit confusing was the collar almost made me feel like it was a school uniform. And that seems strange. That could just be me, but I feel like you've got more going on in the other pieces. Also, this is a whole other genre. This is Greek mythology here. <laughs> like mm -hmm. sometimes it's not good to mix and match all the religion and the mythology it can get a little bit confusing for mm -hmm. some people. Well, that, I don't know. That's just piggybacking off of the idea really quickly. That could be a way to structure the a portfolio in a more broad concept. Like if mm -hmm. you flush out on top of these images, like, oh, a whole theory uh, series on elements of Greek mythology. Then, like, <laughs> it sounds funny to say it this way, but like a little rebranding here, a little like copy copy paste there, and then boom, like make your portfolio about concepts of spirituality. You know, like it's mm. so. Yeah, I, I would say like let let your work direct you where you want it to go, and then title it thereafter. Okay, so we have this piece called "I'm Sorry You Grew Up Before You Had To," and I think in terms of color. This is the piece that I think is probably the least adventurous because I feel that in some of the other ones, you're doing color mixtures that like that one of the shirt and the bee, I just thought was beautifully done. This one, the flesh tone gets a little bit monotonous. Actually, I like the wall better than the flesh tone. The wall seems to shift in coolness and it looks like it's not changing, but it is. So I actually love the wall, which let me tell you, sounds like a weird compliment, but so much of the time people cannot paint blank walls and keep them interesting. It's really hard to do. But in this case, I'm not as into the figure. What do you think, Alex? I would agree. And I almost, going off that, I feel, imagine if the wall and the skin tone like switched mm. and it was this very pale, uh, like kind of pasty flesh tone and then this very bright neon wall. Like, do I think that would work? Maybe not, <laughs> but it's like that idea of thinking like, yeah, we're kind of like Clara was saying, I feel like the flesh in this image, it was very much just like, this is the color it should be. And then it's just placed it on there and exploring kind of how you could use thinking of like, okay, what mood do I want this piece to convey? And then beyond just pose and composition, what colors can I use? And how do I tweak this image to make those colors more prominent? Charisma is asking, what is that thing near the feet? I don't know either. So Jonathan, this is for you. Uh, wait, the white thing? Yeah. Okay, that's a sock. So that's a sock on one foot and then not on the other. Oh, so it's oh. one of those socks that has like the colored toe? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think it's a cropping thing because you don't see the upper part of the sock. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that's oh, what I see. Okay. And people are asking, Neil saying, is this another self-portrait? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's a color thing, but also I think this is another one where that position of putting the hand on the face, it's pretty cliche and you see it a lot. So you have to add something else to the image that gets us into it. It does feel like a personal piece to me. I do get that feeling from the atmosphere, but... I'm just wondering if maybe you need something more specific in the background or in the clothing. It could be any number of things, but that's something that I would consider. So we have a couple of artists that I thought we could recommend to you, Jonathan, because I know you were thinking about 
who else you could be looking at. So this is a plug for my friend, sorry. <laughs> She's a brilliant painter, Kathy Speranza. And we actually are producing this tutorial. I'm working on it right now on her charcoal sketching technique, but she paints roses. And although they're technically still lives, I find her paintings very emotional. And I think they do have a spiritual quality to them, even though they're not meant to be religious and they don't convey specific religious images or stories, I think that there is this feeling to them that I find sort of sad and like there's a longing to these. And so I feel like maybe you might want to look at her work, not just for that, but also for the brushwork because, oh, so jealous of her brushwork. Oh my God, it kills me every time I look at her paintings. So let's take a look at Antonia Lopez Garcia. And Alex, what do you think Jonathan could take from Antonio Lopez Garcia? I think what Garcia is doing the most well is kind of conveying these very standard, typical moments of life. But especially in that diner image, setting it, or the dinner image, setting it in to have that kind of spiritual connotation to it without it being um, overt. And I think that the liveliness and exploration of the brushstrokes and the colors can also be a very powerful way to, for you to convey those messages with it. Like even in comparing this one of the image of the man on the bed versus like the lemon tree, both of them have that emotional impact just in a different way. I've always been struck by how humble a lot of his subjects are. For example, this is just an image of a piece of rabbit meat, I think it is but it, it feels like more than that. And so he's just really interesting in terms of subject matter because sometimes they're like, oh, I'm a figurative painter. He's like painting rabbit meat. He's painting refrigerators, sinks, images of people in bed. I mean, he's all over the place in terms of subject. So he might be a good person for you to look at. Guys, we have an art prof share today. Art Prof Share is where one of you guys creates an artwork in response to one of our videos. And today the Art Prof Share is from Helen Cook. And Helen explains in their statement that they were inspired by our video on texture. And in particular, talking about Eric Carley's work, the children's book illustrator. And so what Helen did was they had a pile of mono prints that were colorful but not well composed. And Helen explains, I haven't glued the strips down perfectly flat in order to give the waves some natural undulations in 3D space, drawing on the sculptural aspect of Anselm Kiefer's work, who we discussed in the stream. And Helen says, thank you for the series. It's interesting to see these fundamentals exemplified by artists' work that I otherwise wouldn't have known or thought about. So how did Helen do, Alex? I think Helen did great with it, capturing the movement with the collage of the wind blowing through the tree is terrific. And I think that was such a smart call of not making the waves even to have a little bit of sporadic nature in how you laid them down. You guys, the technique on this collage is impeccable. Most of the time people don't really want to show <laughs> which piece of paper is on top or below, but don't you guys love that that wave going across, it's almost white, but you can totally see it almost as a paper relief. Collage is tricky. People think it's easy. Well, oh, you just cut paper and glue it down, right? No big deal. Whenever I've done a collage project in my design classes, people discover really quickly, wow, this is hard to do well. So great work, Helen. I think this is beautifully put together and I'm so happy you were able to absorb so much from that stream. So if you guys would like to be considered for an art prof share, all you need to do is go to artprof.org. You're gonna click on tutorials. There's a purple button where you can submit your art prof share. It will take you to a submission form. Or if you guys wanna just show us on Instagram, tag us and use hashtag art prof share. We love to show off what you guys in the community are making. Art prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a little bit, Alex is going to be in the Art Prof Discord in the post live streams channel. So hang out with Alex and see what's going on in there. Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters 
who help us do what we want to do, which is to provide art education for free for everybody who wants it. So we want to say thank you to our supporters. And also thank you so much, Jonathan, for coming onto the stream and discussing your work with us. We're very excited to see where you go. And everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you so much.